Hello, welcome to my session on service quality, the GAPS model, and how to diagnose quality shortfalls. For me, service quality is one of the most important topics in service management. Together with customer loyalty and managing people, it is absolutely critical. And why is this the case? Before I go there, let us look at first, what is quality? How important is it? How can we explain and diagnose gaps and improve quality? And then finally, how much should you invest in service quality? Can you spend too much money on it? And of course you can, right? So the question then is, what is the right level? So let's look first at what is service quality. Quality is really an attitude of the consumer on the global evaluation of a service. So it's not like satisfaction. You know, satisfaction is an evaluation. How happy are you today? Quality is really, uh, in general, how good a company are you? And you can see what drives loyalty is always the prediction. I mean, I buy you today, not because I was happy today with you, because I predict I will be happy with you tomorrow, right? So quality is really the key driver of repeat purchase and loyalty. It's the prediction of the next purchase here. And quality is formed over time based on many uh, consumption experiences, is influenced by word of mouth and many of these things. So quality is relatively stable, is an attitude, is a belief about your company. Now, when would you say a firm delivers excellent service quality? And how we typically define this here is you meet or exceed expectations. So you can ask how often, and for quality, it really means you consistently meet and exceed expectations. So that is quality. That's the construct of service quality. Now that we know what quality is, you can ask, what are the dimensions of service quality? And these are five dimensions that are quite generic and apply to any service. And you can see here, it is tangibles. That is anything you see, all the touch points, all the tangible cues. It's reliability. Do you deliver, do you deliver as promised? It's responsiveness. So are you willing to help customers especially when things go wrong somewhere. The assurance, do I, um, do I trust you that, that you are an expert in, in this? And finally, empathy is about caring, individualized service. <clears throat> now you may ask, uh, how important are these dimensions? And tangibles is interesting, um, especially for service, which we call credence services. That means even you can't really assess the quality in an objective manner. So if you go to, if you go to a surgeon, how do you know a surgeon that did uh, great surgery? If things go right, um, you, maybe it wasn't a very complicated case. If things go wrong, you don't know why things may have gone wrong, right? May have nothing to do with the surgery quality here. So there are certain, certain services, there's a lot of credence. And for example, I, I take universities or business school education. It's one of the most uh, credence type of services where I keep joking, even after consumption, you don't know what you have, right? So for these types of services, tangibles become very important because how do I trust you that, that you deliver great service, that you deliver great quality? And so people use proxies. So for surgeons, there's a, been done a lot of research on how do patients judge the quality of a clinic, judge the quality of a surgeon, and it comes down to a lot of tangibles. Uses plain language, uh, explains things to me as patient. Has nothing beats a clean white coat, for example. Right? Uh, if you have a very high-end private clinic, then it's the furniture, the, the reception, the receptionist. All of those things 
are tangibles that support your overall positioning and can therefore be quite important. But I've seen tons of surveys looking at the relative importance of these dimensions. And one dimension is always top and counts for between 30 to 70% of, of quality as far as customers are concerned. Can you guess which dimension? Yeah, we can, I could have a long discussion in class on this, um, but I can tell you that the most important to customers is reliability, that you do what you promise, that you deliver the value proposition customers came to you for. So if you take a ATM machine, the most beautiful and convenient interface is completely useless if there's no cash in the machine. So nothing beats reliability in products, in services, and in people. Here you can see our poor number 30 here who has an unreliable partner who is more interested in his Valentine than in winning the game. So reliability is really the foundation of quality to deliver what you promised, to deliver the value proposition customers came to you for. Okay, and the others depend a bit on the context, like empathy, for example, in many routine services doesn't really matter. You don't need empathy at a ticket counter if you buy a ticket and everything is fine. You don't want to talk about the weather and how you feel and why you have such a heavy bag full of MBA books and so on, right? You don't want empathy. But if you lose your child in the train system or station or somewhere, then you want all the empathy they can give you as a very urgent to you and you want them to stop the trains and call the hel helicopters and all, right? So just a key takeaway is responsiveness is the core is very important. And then the more intangible, the more credence type a service becomes, also tangibles becomes more important, okay? Now, we said meeting or exceeding customer expectations. So quality is really... How well do you do against uh, expected services and what customers think you're delivering for these five dimensions? And uh, that's the quality gap, right? If, if you deliver less than what customers expect or if customers perceive you to deliver less than, than what they expected, there's a problem. So that was my first part, what is quality? I hope we uh, nailed this now. Now the next is really how important is service quality? And we have tons and tons and tons of research that shows that better quality leads to higher loyalty, leads to word of mouth, leads to increased share of wallet, and therefore leads to higher profitability. One of the first studies, that's a quite an old study now, but it's, it's very nice because this was the first time people really got aware of this, is this study here. It's called PIMS's Profit Impact Market Share Study, and they plotted profitability. You can see return on investment here against market share and relative quality. So market share, that is volume. So obviously, the more volume you have, and we know this from economics, you go down the learning curve, you have economies of scale, economies of scope, your overhead, your R&D is allocated across more units, and therefore profitability goes up. What was new here on this chart, look at relative quality. That if you move from inferior to superior in terms of quality in a segment, your RI also goes up. And what was very surprising, how much, and you can see the impact. So economics really looked at volume and, 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 and unit cost uh, carefully here, but not really on quality. What surprised many was how important quality is compared to volume. And you can see it's almost a mirror, right? It's 7, 14, 21 for volume, 7, 13, 20 for quality. It's 13, 20, 27 for volume. It's 14, 20, 29 for quality. And you can see the most valuable, uh, the most profitable position is you are the market leader and you're the quality leader. 
the, the most profitability and, and the, the company that springs to mind here is really Apple, right? Apple is quality leader and market leader and incredibly profitable. Now, why? So why is quality more profitable? And this is really shown in this chart here, which is the lifetime value of customers. And you can see here that as a customer stays with you longer, they become more profitable and customers only stay with you if your value proposition meets or exceeds their expectations, right? So it's all about the quality delivers. And so the name of the game is really customer loyalty and the key driver of customer loyalty is service quality. Now, given, given that quality is so important, how can we look at why aren't we delivering on quality? How can we think about improving quality? And the, what I have here is the gaps model, which is a beautiful framework because it, uh, it helps you to not just say, oh, there's a quality problem, but it helps you to nail it. Why is there a problem? Is this a policy issue, a product issue, a process issue, and so on and so forth. So you can really see where the, where the issue is here. And the other thing is what I love about it, it is scalable. Meaning you can use it for a whole company. You can use it for a business unit. You can use it for a particular geography or for a particular process or particular product or service or even team, right? So you can see it's, it's really a very nice diagnostic tool that allows you to conceptually to play, play through where are the quality issues. And then given on those issues, it can tell you or guide you, how can you think about fixing those gaps, right? Now let's look at the gaps model here. And uh, this is the gaps model. Now this is academics. Um, they call it the gaps model. These are the, the three very famous researchers in service management, services marketing, is Pasu Parzorman, Len Barry, and Valerie Seidhammer. They developed the gaps model and also the dimensions of quality we just heard. So they spent half their career on, on really nailing um, all the topics around service quality, including surf qual as a measurement tool for quality. But they call it the gaps model. I promise you if a consulting company had done this, they would have uh, trademarked the whole thing, called it quality diagnostic tool or something more uh, exciting. And also the researchers, they looked at, they called them gaps. The original ga gaps model has five gaps. I added one extra gap here, which I explain later. But what you see here is gap six in, in the, this um, model, which is the quality gap. And the gap is really the difference between perceived service and expected service. So it is not something you can say, oh, we measure it, it is what we deliver. No, it's what the customer believes you delivered. So if you're, if you're from the traditional TQM literature where you measure tolerance levels and, and all of those things, they're internal measures of quality. They're not service quality. Service quality is customer defined. So this gap six, I mean, again, if you want a consulting company, you would give all these gaps a proper name. Uh, in, uh, in my textbook, I, I call this the quality gap. So the service quality gap, gap six. So this gap is a function of five other gaps. That means you close the quality gap if all the other five gaps are also closed. So let's look at these gaps. Gap one is really the gap between what customers really expect and what management thinks customers expect. And here management can be, again, depending on the scale you look at it, could be top management, could also be a branch uh, uh, manager, could be a process owner, uh, could be a, a product owner. So it really depends on, on who makes decisions on this service and, and what that person expects or believes customers expect. So we call this the knowledge gap. Yeah, do they have the knowledge about customer expectations. Now we can have a long discussion why in the world is there a 
knowledge gap, right? And I mean, in class, I have a long discussion on this, but let me sort of give you some key reasons here, and I'm sure you can think of more. But one could be is not customer centric enough. So we don't listen to our customers carefully enough. We don't do the right research and, and maybe aggregate and don't look by different personas or customer segments where there may be big differences in expectations, right? <clears throat> it could be that top management has a ton of other problems, uh, mergers, acquisitions, finance, uh, strategy, that this is not important enough for them to spend time on it. Uh, so there's no focus on the customer experience. Um, Another reason is that top management usually cannot mystery shop their own service, so they don't know. So if you are a CEO of an airline and you fly on your airline, have a guess what service level you will experience. Yeah, That then really is in-flight service other airlines talk about. Yeah. Or, you as the CEO, you will never hang on the line to, to try and get through to reservations or resolve a service issue. So you don't understand all of these problems customers have. Customers maybe from very different economic strata, education levels, countries, cultures, and you name it. Yeah. So you can't really experience it yourself and, and you have a very different set of, of expectations on your own. Um, it was quite cute. I mean, many years ago, uh, we, I observed a case, a mini case study, where the CEO of a resort chain was visiting with his family the resort. And we were at the same resort and we wanted to jet ski. And there were the jet skis parked in the bay outside. And we asked, can we jet ski? And we were told, no, I'm so sorry, but the jet skis are all reserved, right? Um, so it turned out that the owner was there. And over dinner, the owner and family may have said something like, uh, weather, nice, jet ski, perhaps. And what did the general manager do of the resort? Block all jet skis. So that if, they, if the owner had known that the jet skis were blocked for him, he would have been terribly upset. But the general manager, I mean, wanted to deliver the best quality service he can to the owner, right? So this is the gap one, this is the knowledge gap here. Now, the second gap is between, okay, what does management think customers want and translate this into service quality, specifications, processes, policies, products. And we call this the policy gap. And why would, custom, why would top management believe that customers want A, but then specify a, we are going to deliver B. Yeah, that doesn't seem to make sense. So why is there a gap? And you can think about this a bit. Why wouldn't you give customers what customers want? And there are two common reasons for that. The first one is very common. I hear you, dear customer, but what you want is just too expensive to deliver. So cost too much. And then after they think a bit longer, they say, and uh, by the way, it's almost impossible to deliver, so we can't do it. So too expensive, cannot be done, are the two most common reasons for the policy gap. To me, if you are able to overcome this too expensive and cannot be done, and obviously it's a hard nut to crack, but if you do this, you can often realize a quantum leap in quality for your customers. And let me give you two quick examples. One is some time ago, I was working uh, for the CEO of, of one of the large uh, property um, management companies. So they have billions of properties under management and all of their customer service processes are of course for tenants. And he wanted to really improve service quality delivered to tenants. He wanted to make his properties more attractive compared to competing properties. So he brought us in as so I was working with a consulting company at that time and, and to do customer process, uh, customer service process redesign. 
And what we usually do, we zoom in in what we call the most hated process. So what is the process your customers are so upset about that we really should do something about it? And the one process we had there was sort of a plan application. That means you go into a property and you want to make am amendments to the property or you have been in the property for some time and, and now you want to make changes to the property. The clients we talked to, they were coughing blood over this. Right? <laughs> they had to put in long architectural drawings and, and, and a ton of work and application and da, 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 da to make changes to the building. And uh, was a large team at the client side working for this process. So we really walked in then and, and asked um, what are customer expectations, right? And they were really complaining, if I want to put a flower pot into the staircase, uh, I have to fill in a ton of forms and wait forever to get it approved. If I want to put in an office partitioner, again, a ton of forms, get it approved. And then we went back to the company. Uh, why do you need all of this stuff? Why does it take so long? I mean, the answer in retrospect is quite simple and is completely online today. But what they hadn't done is they had not stratified the process. So whether you wanted a new flatted factory or whether you wanted to have a flower pot was essentially the same process. So the first thing is we stratified this process into the simple stuff and in the complex stuff. And then the simple stuff, we went one step further. <laughs> Why do you need to know about the flower pot? Why do you need to know about the office partition? And um, the answer that came back was more or less, it is only for compliance. I mean, the company also couldn't care less about the flower pot, but there was fire safety uh, regulation. If that pot blocks escape routes, then there's a problem. Uh, there may be a load. So if your pot is too heavy and is on the staircase, so there's a certain uh, number of kilos on the square foot you can put, right? So these were the only questions of or the, the office partitioner, same story. I mean, they don't care about the office partitioner because when you have to return the office back, you return it back in the original state. But they needed to know, hey, if you put an office partitioner in here, is there a sprinkler in, 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 in both of the rooms? Is there a smoke detector in both of the rooms? And is the fire escape route free? So it's just ticking boxes, right? Uh, are you complying with fire safety regulation? Yeah. So next question we ask is, hey, you know, um, can your client determine this himself or herself, right? Are they professional enough? Do they know this? And the answer is, well, our clients are global MNCs. They have property managers who themselves are more senior than our officers who approve this here. So of course they can assess that. Next question is, can you trust your customer? So we ask legal and legal said, of course, never trust anyone, right? <laughs> so then we ask legal, so what do we have to do that we can trust our customers on this so that we can allow customers to make these changes and just notify us? So legal came back and they said, it's very simple. You have to change the rental contract where you say as a client, you can do this and this and this. And if you put an office petitioner here, the rules and regulations for that you have to follow. So the whole thing is online now that you put in a picture and a drawing, and then you click that there's a fire escape route is free and a sprinkler is on both sides, smoke detector is on both sides. And then you, you digitally sign the whole thing and it is done. Yeah. So with this very simple moving, so changing contracts and moving the work in a way back to the customer made it very easy for the, both customer and the, and the company here. So a, a quantum leap in productivity gain for the company and a quantum leap in service quality improvement for the client. So this was this first, they said, we can't do it, but if you work hard enough and you can, you're creative and, and, and you do what we, what we did here as customer service process, redesign, you can overcome those things. So this is the cannot be done. Yeah, if you can do it, there's a, there's, a, there's a big benefit for you here. And the second one, the too expensive. Yeah, same thing here. I heard this many times. Yeah, I hear you that you like this, but um, it's just not cost effective to deliver that to you. 
And whenever I hear too expensive, and whenever you hear too expensive, you should think about tiered service. And again, for this property company, we had a standard outsourced um, contractor for maintenance and repair for lifts and escalators. And the standard response time was like two hours. And some customers said, um, that's not good enough for us. We have very sensitive vaccines or, or medication or whatever. We can't wait for the guy to come show up in two hours. We need a 30 minute response time. So the questions to ask for you here is number one, um, is this the only customer who has this need or is there a whole segment for a premium service? So if it's the only customer, you still can think is this customer important enough that I do an exception for this customer. If it's a whole segment for heaven's sake, develop a premium solution at a premium price. So how much should you change, charge more? Uh, I can tell you a lot. And why? If you move from two hour response time to a 30 minute response time, you're going to need more engineers, more dis dispatch centers. You may have to drop someone else's job to go to a priority client here. So maybe you charge 100% more for two hours, right? And at the same time, not every customer may need a two hour response time. So why would it make sense in addition to a premium product also to have an economy product? So you say, I attend to you within five working days and I give you a discount, right? And why would that make sense for the service provider? Very simple that um, it really helps you to spread your load, your workload. Um, if everyone is on two hours and, and 30 minutes, there will be times there's so much demand, you will disappoint customers here. And I mean, lift maintenance is interesting. One of my executive MBA students, he was with Otis Elevators, and I didn't know that before, but he told me even lifts are moody. Yeah, <laughs> they don't break down random. And they tend to break down before long holidays and right after long holidays, right? And why? Before a long holiday, everyone rushes with their projects and is so busy, people come early and leave late. And the lift is operating the whole day, uh, very heavy load. And uh, that's uh, the likelihood of a breakdown is higher. And it is even worse after a long holiday. You had an idle lift for four or five days. And then they come back on the first day of work and whoom, they're so busy and the lift is going up and down, up and down. And again, the likelihood of a breakdown is much higher. So what you will have then, if you're, everyone is on half an hour, two hour response time, then uh, after the long holiday, we are, are gonna be so busy and not, be, not able to deliver to our KPIs. Yeah? But if you have some customers on a five day response time, you never serve them during the peak. Let's say at NUS Business School, we have uh, two, two buildings here. One building is only four stories. If the lift breaks down, that's very easy. Dean can send an email to, to all, everyone, says, dear staff, dear colleagues, dear students, um, I declare the healthy working week. Please take the staircase. We switched off the lift, right? <laughs> so, so, and then most of the time what happens, yes, you have a five-day response time, but unless there's sort of a real crunch, you probably address even same day or next day. So it's you, the five days only for you that you have a tail end that if things are really tight, you can distribute capacity. So that means you have a premium standard economy sort of solution, a tiered service solution here. And that does two, two things. It takes from the peak out those customers who are not so sensitive for the service and it allows you to run at a much higher uh, utilization or load factor of your, of your team here. And I mean, one of the companies I always admire is Singapore Airlines. Uh, their cargo business never tells you it's too expensive. Yeah. They just ask you, does it fit into a 747? And if yes, however difficult, they will transport it for you. And even very difficult freights, they made a name for themselves, let's say for flying racing horses between Hong Kong, Singapore and London and Dubai. 
so these horses fly first class right uh, they are very valuable and and so yeah there's a lot of effort singapore airlines puts into into flying those so uh, and they charge through their nose of that for, for cost of course same as for sea world in australia a lot of the whales and and and, and sharks and and so these animals were air flown singapore airlines so when you hear too expensive think in segmenting the market and then tiering your solution that you can actually spend that extra money to deliver the extra value to your customer. So that's the policy gap. The third gap is the delivery gap. And you may ask, why in the world do I have a delivery gap? I have a, I have a KPI two ring pickup. Why doesn't my staff pick up in two rings? Right? And then many times people think the 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 policy gap is really because of what? Staff skills, staff attitude. And I can tell you, yes, sometimes this is an issue, but most of the time it is not the key issue. Most of the time you have delivery gap because capacity in place is insufficient, support tools, processes don't work. Yeah, so it's, it's you're not enabling your frontline to shine, to be heroes. I mean, um, for example, in Singapore, we have a tax deadline, which is the same day every year. I think, I think it's 15th of April. The first year I was in Singapore, I had to do my tax declaration. So I tried to call Inland Revenue Authority on the 13th of April. Guess what? <laughs> I'm not the only one who has questions, right? So, so you can see, however good your staff, they will never be able to deliver this huge peak of calls that is before the deadline, maybe shortly after the deadline, and for the rest of the year, it's going to be low. So you have to think of other ways how you fix this delivery gap here. And if insufficient capacity is the issue, yeah, then you have to look at either the increased capacity of call center staff here, which is very expensive to cater for certain peaks. If that doesn't work, Maybe you can lower the peaks, right? Now, one way which one could do, for example, rather than having everyone has the same tax deadline, you split it across 12 months. So people with the surname letter starting with A, B, C, they have the deadline in, in January and X, Y, Z have the deadline in December. So that means there's an equal load. Yeah. I mean, Singapore didn't do this. They have a very easy tax system. It's all online now and quite self-explanatory. That's the other way, right? How you, you, you take demand out in some way. So the gap three is all about uh, capacity in place, support process, skill set, and attitudes of your frontline. That's gap three, the service delivery gap. Now, gap four, also called the communications gap. So what you have is, you have external communications that could be personal selling, sales force, business development, uh, and so on. It could be mass communications. It could be the website, whatever. You're, deliver, you're promising, you're delivering promises here and your delivery doesn't match. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, you look at ads for airlines, they feature first class is, is, is maximum two passengers, minimum one cabin crew, silverware, orchid, bottle of champagne, and you come on board and you don't see any of that, right? You miss the small print here, first class only. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in consulting or in, in sales is the same thing, right? If, if I am a sales guy, I want to do the sale, I promise the moon to you until you sign on the dotted line, right? Because I want the sale. So I overpromise because I want to sell, whether it's mass communications, whether that's personal selling. Yeah. And I'm sure in uh, many of you in the audience here, you're either in sales, business development, or you're in operations and can relate to this. What you will have is you ha will have uh, people in sales who are selling and just imagine if you are in sales, you're short of your quota, there's a really difficult project to be sold, you can sell it, but you overpromise, and you know it's going to be a challenge to deliver, will you sell? Well, if you fulfill your KPIs with this, of course you sell, right? And then you turn to your good friend in, in operations and says, hey, Jimmy, uh, uh, this is going to be a very difficult customer, I'm sorry, but this is, was a very important sale for the company here. This is a strategic customer and a strategic project. 
Yeah, I guess you heard this before. All the difficult stuff is strategic. Yeah, strategic customer, strategic project. And I know this is in good hands with you. Thank you so much for taking care of it. Bye bye. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you, you see, the the incentives are not aligned here. Yeah. So of course, I mean, you can think from how do I align. Um, that's why in consulting companies, you do not tend to have this gap because the partner who sells is the partner who delivers and partner is not incentivized on sales, but they're incentivized based on contribution generated. So they have to worry, what does it cost to deliver this, this project as promised, right? So you have to align incentives. That's one way. Yeah. The other is also markets. If you constantly overpromise, you say you're going to deliver uh, by um, 1st of July. Um, and you promise that. But I, as a customer, know that sometimes you deliver, sometimes you don't, sometimes you can be quite late. So what do I do with your promise 1st of July? Uh, I, I discount your promise. And if this is a mission critical thing for me, do I? buy from you promise 1st of July and there's some question mark over whether you will deliver or do I buy from your competitor who says 15th of July but they always deliver yeah. so if it's critical for me I, I may go with the known delivery date even if it's later so in service very often you don't have to be better it is, it is sometimes good enough to be more reliable Okay, so the, you have to the communications gap here. Now, the, the fifth gap, the last gap is really the perception gap. So you deliver, but the customer doesn't see what you deliver. Yeah, so they, they, they can't see it. Maybe it's a credence service. So you say you use a healthy oil in, in your kitchen or you use sustainably sourced uh, food ingredients or local food, in, uh, whatever. I mean, I may or may not be able to taste that. And I will just have to believe you like the hygiene conditions in your kitchen and so on. So the question is here, how do you tangibilize what you're really doing for your customers? So often you need extra communications. You just look at for uh, one of the best practices I like is Starbucks. They tell you so much, you go to the Starbucks website, you can see all of the stories of where they source their beans, who the growers are. So that gives you, that makes things visible to you. You wouldn't know otherwise. But basically the, the perception gap is you have to ensure that customers see what you put into the service to make that tangible. Yeah, and, and hotels in the old days, I still remember, they put a little sign in the bathroom or on the toilet which said disinfected. Yeah. But I mean, do you know whether it was disinfected or the sign just put there? You still don't know, right? But I mean, you're, you're working on trying to communicate better. Now, the last gap is really the, the quality gap here. This is when you look at all these five gaps, if you close them all, then there is no more quality gap. So you deliver according to customer expectations. Now, two things here. The gaps model is um, works the best or, or really shows you the causes of quality best in highly structured services. So you think of a McDonald's. McDonald's is motion design and industrial design of every, every movement you make, every equipment you make, every taste you do, how many grams of sugar, how many whatever. It's completely standardized. So if there is a gap one somewhere, that will cascade through all the way to customer perceptions. <clears throat> because it's a very tightly organized company. However, in many companies, they're not so structured. Let's say a professional service firm or my university here, right? I mean, um, in the end, uh, in, the in the consulting company, in the university, the professionals, they want to deliver great value and satisfaction to the customer. 
And they offer, often buffer that customer interaction from all the nonsense that goes on inside the organization. I'm sure you can relate to that, right? So many times we do stuff for our customers, yeah, in spite of all the stuff that happens in our back. And why we do this is because all of the stuff is loosely, only loosely connected. So in a university, I mean, people have tenure, people are professionals, people want to be successful in the classroom. So never mind what the dean says or the vice dean says, yeah, whatever stupid decisions they make. Um, if I'm in the classroom and I run my courses, I do my course design and all of this, I can ignore all of that. I just make sure I'm successful with what I'm doing for my customers, right? So you can see the more structured, the more these gaps will carry through, the less structured, the more, if you have the right front line here, the more the front line can buffer and still deliver quality, even if internally things are not as good as they should be. Now, you can also ask, uh, looking at the gaps model here, what do you think are the most difficult gaps or the most difficult gap to close? Or if that question is too difficult, what is the easiest gap to close? Now you can think about this a little bit. And many people actually get it wrong here of all of the gaps. I mean, if you think about how to close them, the gap three, the delivery gap, is the most difficult gap to close. Why? It's a never ending story. That's why service operations are so challenging, right? You never have the right capacity, the right processes, the right skill set, the right support processes, and so on in place. It's, it's a moving target, it's changing all the time, right? I mean, you think your capacity is right, but then something happens and, you know? So the, 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 the delivery gap to me is an ongoing story. You can approximate closing it, but it, it requires constant fine tuning, constant running, constant management. To me, so the gap three delivery gap is the most uh, difficult. The easiest gap for me, what I think is really gap one. And the interesting thing, this is either really, really, really easy or impossible. And that completely depends on the attitude and orientation of management. So if management thinks customer service doesn't matter, whatever you do, gap one will be there. And my experience is at some point, this whole thing blows up and you change management. <laughs> yeah. uh, but if you get a new CEO who really wants to drive up quality, that's the fastest and easiest gap to close. And in my experience, I mean, in a week, I can tell you what's wrong and what's right. Yes, I mean, if I, if I want, to, want to understand customer expectations, I usually hunt for two things. Number one is, what is it my customers really love? Why I want to cement the strengths? And what is the custom, my customers really hate? So these are the weaknesses I need to work on. And all I do for gap one is very easy. I usually uh, do a content analysis of all the feedback we have, whether that's social media, complaints, compliments. I may talk to a few frontline people. I may talk to a few customers. And I can tell you in a week what's right, what's wrong. So gap one can be closed quite fast. Gap two, we discussed policy and processes. It's not rocket science. We know how to do this but it takes a little bit of time, right? Process redesign for all customer service processes can be a two to three year exercise. Um, designing new products and, and, and so on also takes a bit of time. Uh, so gap two is, is not that difficult, but requires uh, yeah, uh, quite a significant management push and support here and, and, and investment and takes one to three years. So this is gap two, gap three, we said is never ending. Gap four, that we, we know gap four is all about um, uh, aligning KPIs between sales and operations and also communications, right? That, that we don't overpromise. Anyway, overpromise won't last long in the market. Gap five is all about understanding the tangibles, the perception points, the touch points customers have and managing those. So how do customers judge you? 
So what is it about your app, about your website, about your facilities, about how your call center interacts with customers and so on that um, makes them judge your quality or in terms of processes, what tangible things are there like delivery times and slots and, and so on and so forth. So we have to understand the perception points here, the touch points, the moments of truth, and therefore then design them in a way that it communicates the right quality. Okay, so that is the gap model here. Now, my last question before ending this chapter is really uh, try to understand, can I spend too much money on service quality? And of course you can. Yes, you can spend too much money on anything. My own experience is though that customer, uh, companies tend to underinvest in quality, not overinvest. But still, we should understand um, what is the correct level of spending here? What should we shoot for when we want to improve quality? And the next chart helps you to think this through. What it shows you is. If you are a lousy company in terms of service reliable, reliability are way down here, you can look at a small improvement that can have a quantum leap in service reliability or, or, or quality. If you're already pretty good, you need to spend more money to move up further up the curve. If you are world class, you're cutting edge, it becomes really uh, expensive expensive to close that gap further here because you can't just copy someone you have to do r d you have to think and you have to go further here so the question is how far do you go and let me give you one example here this is a little bit embarrassing for singapore but we are a financial center and the financial center has to have a, a stock exchange and the stock exchange needs power Okay, so we had outage of power on the Singapore Stock Exchange that stopped trading. Clear service failure, right? So the question is, uh, what do you do? So if you can't rely on public power, you then put an uninterrupted power supply to support and that kicks in the minute the public network doesn't deliver um, your UPS uh, kicks in. Now, of course, the Singapore exchange did have a UPS and the problem was it failed too. <laughs> okay, so what you have is you have network fails, UPS fails. So the probability of the network failing is very low. Uh, the probability then of the backup failing is also very low, but there's a residual and that just happened. So what you can do is you can put a backup for the backup, of course, you have a third option. So in case both fail, the third one kicks in. But you can see you spend a lot of money for a tiny probability here um, that both of both previous uh, systems fail. And then, I mean, you can see even you have a backup for the backup, there is still a residual probability that the network fails, that all, all three of them fail, right? So in mathematical terms, what you will have is that the failure likelihood approaches zero but never will be truly zero. <coughs> so the question really is, how far do you go? Yeah. And let me do a very, very uh, short little exercise here. And um, for example, um, Singapore Airlines here has a offloading. This was published in the newspapers. I'm not telling any secrets here but of about one over 10,000 passengers. So you have a ticket, you're confirmed, and you're denied boarding, right? One over 10,000. So what would perfect quality mean? Yeah, perfect quality means zero offloading, right? So if you tell your revenue managers, never ever offload a passenger, how much overbooking can they do? Yeah, and that is then also zero. And I can tell you with zero overbooking, you can never make an airline 
profitable because you have so many no-shows that you as a network never reach break even, right? So if I relax that a little bit from, I tell my revenue manager, okay, you can offload one passenger per whatever period. And you can ask how much overbooking can I do? And now I can overbook all flights by one passenger. And only if this very unlikely case happens that everyone shows up, um, then after that, I don't overbook anymore. But that, that, that probability is almost zero, right? It's, it's approaching zero. But it means if I have 40,000 flights a year, I can sell 40,000 more tickets. If I take a $500 average contribution per ticket, that means my incremental contribution is $20 million. So I just want to show you to go from virtually perfect, which means um, potentially offload one passenger, but the probability is very, very low, to never overbook I never overload a passenger. That cost to me is $20 million, right? So of course the question now is, so zero is clearly not working and one overbooking also doesn't work. So how far do I go down the line? Currently I'm one over 10,000. So should I go one over 20,000, one over 5,000, one over 1,000? So what, he, what is here the correct level of overbooking? And what data do you need to look at to, to determine this, right? Um, we could spend a long time here on quantitative analysis, but I just want to give you the gist for this. So let's assume I, um, uh, I take Singapore to Melbourne as a $500 contribution. Does it mean I upgrade the, I go, go this curve all the way until the incremental customer delivered as promised costs me $500 and then I fail. So basically I go up to contribution and not beyond, right? So that's the, that is the margin. Now you can look at cost of service failure here. So if you offload this gentleman who is traveling to the wedding of his only daughter to Melbourne, and the wedding is the next day and you offload him today, what's going to happen? I right? can imagine, I mean, uh, this person is going to be hopping mad and, and will tell you at the airport, I will never ever fly Singapore Airlines again. Yeah. Um, you can ask, so what's the cost of this? And you can do your computation. I mean, number one, do you believe this passenger that he's never ever going to fly you again? And, and I mean, look, you're the hub in Singapore and you have the best departure times and the best network. So what's likely to happen is that this passenger will say, look, you were my preferred airline in the past. Uh, now you're my not preferred airline. So I fly other airlines more. So you're going to lose some share of wallet of this customer. So maybe he spent 10,000 a year on travel in the past. And now he spends of these 10,000 with you. And now he only gives you 2,000 of these 10,000. You lose 8,000 in year one. But if you're very lucky, what happens is in year two, he also experiences Air France goes on strike. Air Canada loses the baggage. And I mean, no airline is perfect, right? So he has other problems with other airlines. He says, oh, actually, Singapore Airlines is not so bad. So you regain that passenger's trust. And you increase, again, your share of wallet, right? So that means that maybe in year one is 7,000 lost. Year two is 3,000. Uh, year one is seven. Year two is 3,000. Year three, you're back to where you were before. So you lose $10,000 in contribution. So the cost of that failure, I mean, ignoring social media and other stuff by now, for now, means, yeah, you have two data points here now, two numbers. One is $500 contribution and the other is $10,000 cost of failure. So if you have only these two and nothing else, think about it. Would it make sense to spend more than $500 to prevent a $10,000 loss in contribution, right? 
And it's quite obvious. I mean, let's say it costs you $700 or $800. Is money well spent to save these $10,000 in contribution, right? So by right, if it's really, if these numbers are hard, you can go all the way up to 10,000 and you would only stop improving the service after, ex, ex, after the cost exceed 10,000 because then it's cheaper to disappoint this passenger than to recover somehow uh, or deliver as promised. But between these two, what you usually have, you have margin and you have, you have cost of, of uh, failure. A number that's usually always between these two is what we call service recovery cost. You not incur the 10,000. You do something that, yes, you don't deliver the seat as promised, but you do something else. You do a smart service recovery that makes the passenger as happy with the recovery than this passenger would have been with the service delivered as promised, right? Um, number one, do you offload this passenger who is uh, traveling to the wedding of his only daughter? No, right? You, you offload who? Uh, ideally, the German backpacker, right? So he is not so hung up over getting there on time. And how do you do that, right? And... Um, I know American Airlines, for example, they do something like call reverse auctions here. So I could, could see the students in, in some of the big US airports, they wait at the semester and they wait at the gate. Uh, flights are usually overbooked. And then at some point, the gate agents will say, look, you know, we are overbooked. Does anyone volunteer to give up his or her seat and we give you $300? Uh, and of course, then the... The students, they look at each other and says 300, uh, maybe not enough, right? So then say 400, 500, then, oh yes, uh, 500, right? So then the passengers get quite happy. They get 500 bucks. The seat is available for somebody who really wants to fly. I mean, it's quite a cute story. My son was visiting my wife in Toronto. So he was flying Munich to Toronto and they offloaded him on the flight to Toronto and he stayed in a five-star hotel. He got some meal money for a steak and a glass of wine. And um, so he was very happy. And he got, I think, got 500 euros to compensation because it was an intercontinental flight. And on the flight back, he was so disappointed that he wasn't offloaded, right? <laughs> uh, uh, what Singapore Airlines does is preemptive offloading. I mean, you overbook, overbook, and you look at what, what we call booking rate. And, and there's sort of a number, they call it minus 20, minus 30, that says minus 30 means I've got 30 more reservations than I have seats. And as the departure date approaches, I hope that there are enough cancellations that I'm at zero. But if the shifting and cancellations don't come in, and I know, wow, I'm minus 15, I think five people will not show up. That means I'm 10 seats short. And they do something called preventive offloading. So they call the night before, sir, uh, we are quite overbooked tomorrow. Would you mind flying on a later date? Or we give you some compensation or something, right? And then they, they hit me, says, oh, thank you for telling me. No, I have to be there. I have to give a keynote speech. And it's very important that I'm there. But thank you for warning me. I will come early. I will check in baggage. And you can't get rid of me, right? <laughs> but then they hit my mom. And my mom says, uh, she's here in Singapore on holiday. And they ask, oh, ma'am, uh, would you mind flying a day later? We give you $500 shopping money. Then my mom would say, what? I says, oh, that is so wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, can I stay for the whole week? right so you can see if you, if you do this quite smart here this a service recovery for um for uh offloading let's say to melbourne it's going to cost you more than 500 than your margin because you have to you have to pay for airport transfer you have to pay for five-star hotel you have to give some money for food and so on so maybe that costs you 750 dollars so my assumption, of course, is that, that uh, the service recovery is so well designed that the customers who experience it are as happy with the recovery than they would have been if they had experienced the service as promised. So in services marketing, we never say we want 100% reliability. But what we are saying is, we want 100% satisfied customers. And how we satisfy our customers is 9,999 times we deliver as promised. And the one over 10,000 times where we can't deliver, 
will give you a service recovery that will also satisfy you. So I can see the breaking point here, the optimal breaking point of reliability is, let's say if the cost of failure, or here in this sense, cost of failure is cost of service recovery is $750. That means I improve the service until it hits $750 for the incremental customer delivered as promised. And then after that, I deliver service recovery because that is cheaper, so for the tail end. But the objective is 100% customer satisfaction. Good. So this was a long session on managing service quality. And so we can think about what are your key takeaways. So what is your understanding after this session on what is service quality? Why is delivering great quality so important? Then the diagnostic tool on, on looking at where are the causes of quality issues and how can you potentially fix them. And the last one was, can you spend too much on service quality? And yeah, of course, we discussed this and what would be the breaking point between delivering as promised and delivering satisfaction through a professional service recovery. So please think yourself now, what do you think is your most important takeaway from this session? What's the biggest challenge you see for your company? And what is the biggest opportunity you see?